process versus product. That's not normally a topic that we argue over with each other, yet it's fundamental to our worldview. We look at Peter being so full of the Holy Spirit that he could walk down the street and his shadow falling on somebody would heal them. That's an example of product. There was no direct engagement between him and the sick people who were healed. They were just healed. Now you contrast that with Jesus leaving Israel with his 12 so that he could accomplish some training for them. The Syrophoenician woman pesters Jesus and there's that profound dialogue where he pushes her away and she pushes back and she wins. There's so much in that process of Jesus engaging her that we can learn from. I am passionate about process and very concerned about the fact that there's few things that imprison ministry leaders more quickly than success. When a tool has worked, when a strategy has been effective, it tends to become the gold standard for future ministry instead of being a tool that worked in one situation. So let me walk you through a scenario that I had today showing how I tilt the process toward learning from the process, even though I'm obviously deeply vested in the product of freedom. Sally has been on a DIY journey for a long time. I have observed from a distance and appreciated her tenacity in life. She brings an awful lot to the table in her journey, and it's been a tough journey. Late yesterday evening, she texted me about a scenario that was illogical. This and that had appeared in her inner world, and it seemed to not fit any of our paradigms. I wrote back with a suggestion, try this, and then I went to bed because I was tired. Woke up this morning, and my suggestion had made things dramatically worse. Good morning, Arthur. So we got on the phone and have a scenario that doesn't make sense and a strategy that had backfired and made her inner world worse. So against that backdrop, I am not really focused on the product. Yes, I want her free. Yes, we want the mystery resolved. But obviously, when a tool that has worked very well elsewhere made things worse for her, we need to re-examine the process instead of focusing on the product. So I tried two or three things, everything bounced, nobody inside was able to help, and we were well in touch with all of her human spirit, good relationship there. So I backed off and said, Holy Spirit, we don't know where to go or what to do. Would you give us a picture, a clue? She got nothing. I immediately got a comic strip picture. There's any number of comics that feature a bad guy who gets kicked in the behind and goes flying through the air, landing on his face. It's a stereotypic picture. There was no particular comic I was looking at, just somebody's right foot in the behind of the bad guy going flying. The bad guy being attached to her brain in this particular situation. What was fascinating is that it was Servant who was doing the kicking. Her spirit has been very much a unit. All seven portions are there, but they move as a herd from project to project to project. So this was a step forward in the journey of singling out servant of all the portions of the spirit to take the lead, to leave the others who were all clustered at the reality pillar and to go to Sally's brain and boot the bad guy. I floated the idea to see how it would land and unexpectedly servant said, yeah, I can try. Unexpectedly to me because servant had been 
No, because the Spirit had worked as a team heretofore. So obviously God knew something I didn't know. God knew the Spirit was ready to differentiate. Cool. All good. So Servant went to the brain and gave several good kicks, and they all landed on some sort of a barrier, and the critter remained there unconcerned. So that created another process problem. We had followed the lead of the Lord and it hadn't worked. So I go back to saying, all right, Lord, uh, what do you want to show us? And immediately he took me to the picture of segmented time. Remember our teaching elsewhere, Revelation 4.8, if you're not familiar with it, type the reference into our search engine. It's uh, standby. God is the God of unitary segmented time. Unitary meaning that he's in all time. He doesn't have to move from past to present to future. He's in all time. But we live in segmented time. And the segments are part of the majesty of our relationship with God. Because we can look at the past and divided up into all of these seasons of our life, most particularly before and after salvation, before and after baptism, and before and after our addressing a particular issue. So my theory was, just to guess, by God raising the issue of segmented time, that we had a leaky segment, that this critter was secured by something in the past that should be under the blood of Christ, because let me tell you what, Sally is an old pro when it comes to confession. She knows how to put stuff behind the cross. So with that picture, I simply floated a request to God that he would move through the timeline and secure all the segments to make all the barriers be exactly what they should be. And the majesty of Christianity is that the segments are leaky. I use the illustration of every cell in our body. Every cell has a doorway. It receives and it gives. It receives raw material and it does something in its little factory and it sends out waste product that need to be disposed and a partially finished product that another cell needs to work on. So the segments are designed to be waterproof, if you will, from the junk. The junk stays on the other side of the segment. But our generational blessings, our connection with God, the lessons that we've learned during the bad times in life, those go forward. So the majesty of the segments, the majesty of each of the cells of our life being semi-permeable. They don't let just anything in. They don't let just anything out. There's a, a huge... Majesty, there's no other word for it, for the ability of each cell to let in and not let in this, that, and the other. And the same thing with our segments. They're supposed to block the past, keep the past where it belongs, under the blood of Christ, not affecting the future, while letting the treasures go, go through to the present, accumulate, accrue. So I prayed that in shorthand, since she knows the theology and God knows it better than I do. And she reported that a lot was happening. She couldn't see, but knew that there was a lot of churn. I said, great. So we sat there in silence and waited for God to get done repairing all of the different segments. So he did. She reported closure. Things were still. She couldn't see anything different, but a process had begun and come to completion. So I said, great. And I said, servant, why don't you try your good right foot again? Servant did, and critter left. There was some other stuff in there, but I'm just illustrating the process. When critter was gone, there was a real mess in that area of the brain. And again, that creates all sorts of possibilities. My experience is that most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, God uses angels to clean up the mess before there's repair to the actual tissue. So I floated that. I said, God, if, 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 if it's appropriate, would you send angels to take out the trash? He did. The fact that that has worked 
a hundred times in the past doesn't mean it's what he wants to do in the present. John Wimber gave me the single most important spiritual warfare and inner healing tool that I've ever had. He said, you come to every session with an empty toolbox. And the fact that God has used angels in the past doesn't mean that's his process here. But it was. Angels came, they took out the trash, servant is watching, and then when the trash is taken out, there's this big old wound in the brain. Again, I have history with repairing holes in the brain, but what God did for Fred, Joe, or Mac does not mean that's what he wants to do for Sally. So I asked the Lord, what happens with the hole in the brain? And he immediately directed me to teacher, which again is very familiar territory. Medicine came into the world on the third day of creation when God created the herbs. And most commonly, teacher that is the priestly healing tribe is involved in healing. So we talked with teacher, suggested the teacher go back to the pillar of responsibility and be fully resourced with the latest, greatest assets that are there before coming to heal the story. No, heal the whole. Teacher went, teacher came, and worked for a bit, but then needed something extra. And at that point, I felt it needed to be someone for the Trinity. So I asked and said, is there a portion of the Trinity that's supposed to partner with teacher in this? And the morning star showed up. Now, this is profound. As each of the different pillars of wisdom, the seven pillars are restored in her inner world, there is some direct or indirect reflection of the nature of God, the Trinity. And just recently, the pillar of reality had been restored and the morning star came to the spirit in the context of the pillar of reality. And now it's the morning star that came to partner with teacher to work on this hole in the brain. Now the morning star is loosely identified with exhorter because it was on the exhorter day of creation that the stars were created. So for the morning star to come to the pillar of reality when it was restored, sure, makes total sense. For the morning star to come and partner with teacher in healing a hole in the servant portion of the brain, I had no grid for that, didn't see it coming, doesn't matter. I'm just walking through the situation lightly, gingerly, seeking to partner with God's processes. Morning star came, and that's when Sally said, I've always been obsessed with a verse in Job about the morning stars. So now I know a piece of process that is immense. When we obsess over a passage of scripture for decades before experiencing and understanding it, it's because it's critical to our journey. So henceforth, whatever happens in her inner world, whenever she gets stuck, I'm just gonna float the question, have you checked with the morning star to see if this is a place for Jesus to come in that facet of his authority? My point in all of this is that there's not a right way to fix the same thing all the time. The angels coming to take out the trash, familiar. Absolutely common scenario that that's what they do when the devil has left a mess behind. But not every case, just in most cases. On the other hand, the morning star coming to partner with teacher in healing brain damage I was absolutely new, never seen that before, and that is why it is so dangerous to define the present by your past successes. It doesn't matter if God has done the same thing with the same tool 100 times in a row in your ministry session. Sally is person 101, and if we barge in with our expectations, we cheat the client of the possibility of growing. Clearly for Sally, 
The morning star is not just related to the pillar of wisdom, but to every facet of her life. And the engagement of the morning star with the teacher in the healing process, in the servant portion of the brain, was absolutely new, a first for me. Will I ever see it again? I have no idea, it doesn't matter, because I walk gently in every session, seeking to find out what God wants to do, which portion of the Spirit works where, which principle is in play, which member of the Trinity wants to establish some new facet of his nature in the experience and the journey of the individual. So Sally reported that it's going to be a while, maybe a few days, while teacher and Morning Star are partnering together to repair that area of the brain. So we checked out, went on down the road. But my message for you today is do not let success make you small. The fact that something works, the fact that something works repeatedly, doesn't mean that's the only way God's ever going to do it. And therefore, to stay nimble as the leader of the team, to continually ping heaven and find out how God wants to do any particular step will bring the greatest maturity and the greatest transformation. Again, I'm happy for everybody that Peter healed with his shadow. That's an amazing expression of the power of God. I have not healed anybody with my shadow. So far as I know, my shadow is not packing a punch to people or trees or anything else. I'm not even sure that my shadow intimidates critters. My shadow's not juiced. So I admire and respect the authority that Peter walked in, but it's the process stories that carry the principles that are transferable to different areas of our life. Every time you engage with somebody, even if it's a familiar scenario, not an oddity like we faced this time, Find out how God wants to do it, because the God of process teaches us so much.